Hi everybody, this is an intro to the Quantopian lecture series. So if you're already familiar with Quantopian and with the lecture series, please feel free to skip ahead. Quantopian is a crowdsourced investment firm. And our goal is to democratize quantitative finance and to level Wall Street's playing field by providing a lot of free tools and data of the same caliber that you would run into as a professional on Wall Street. Our business model is to provide capital allocations to the best algorithms that are developed on the platform. To this end, we've developed a pretty extensive educational curriculum to make sure that our users are well educated. The Quantopian lectures are developed in conjunction with and are used for teaching by professors at top universities all around the world. We also work with industry practitioners to make sure that all the examples that we teach are current and up to date with techniques that are actually being practiced in the field today. In general, we try to teach theory and intuition hand in hand so that once you've learned a concept, you have readily accessible code snippets to then go out and apply it. Let's get right into it then and see what we're getting into today. Today we're going to talk about universe selection, which is an important first step in setting up your algorithm. We can think of the universe that an algorithm trades within as a sort of white list that okays the securities that an algorithm is allowed to trade. Your algorithm is going to carry out all sorts of calculations, do all sorts of mathematics on everything that's available to it. So by restricting those securities, we can avoid trading things that we don't actually want to trade. In addition, some signals are going to be more predictive in some universes than others. If you developed a signal with one set universe in mind, if you then try to extend that universe, the signal may not be viable anymore uh, in that larger space. So with Pipeline, we have about 8,300 different securities that are available. And there's no way that we want to be trading all of these individually. There are going to be lots of securities within this overall universe, this larger universe, that are illiquid or that are targets of mergers or that have various other characteristics that we may not necessarily want to run into when we're, uh, when we're handling, handling our algorithm. Because our algorithm has its set of instructions. It has its assumptions that it operates under. So if the algorithm cannot place trades according to the assumptions that it has that underlie it, then you're not going to be actually executing the model as intended. So your algorithm is probably going to break down. Or if it doesn't break down, then you have this unexplained return that you can't be confident about anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a very basic implementation of a universe that we're going to call the Lectures 500. What we're going to do is we're going to implement a universe as a pipeline screen. So if you're not familiar with pipeline, check out our tutorial. It's at quantopian.com slash tutorials. And it's right in there. So give that a shot. Pipeline's a very powerful tool for factor modeling and defining the universe that you actually want to trade. So what we're going to do is we're first going to import our libraries here. And let's say that our universe is going to be our top 500 stocks by revenue, right? This is a pretty decent indicator. High amounts of revenue indicate a healthy company, right? If we have large amounts of revenue coming in, that means that the company's probably doing well. So this is a very naive universe, as you might expect. But it's, it's a good place to start from in order to figure out what would be better. So what we do is we define our universe according to this Morningstar income statement. We just get the total revenue, and we say that we want the top 500. Then we add this revenue as a column in our pipeline. And we also add this universe as our screen. So this, this universe as a screen part is really the important part uh, that we're looking at. Uh, we just also want to see what the revenue is of these top 500 stocks. I if we wanted to uh, look at price or anything, we would instead toss price in as a column here, uh, right under revenue. And then we would have the price of the securities that pass this pipeline screen of the top 500 revenue stocks. And then what we're going to do is we're going to run this pipeline over one day, January 1st, 2016. So it's starting and ending the same day. So we're just going to have the 500 securities that had the highest revenue on this one day. So here, let's just print out the beginning of what we have. This is going to be the first 10 constituents for this first day. And this is going to be the equity part of our index. And this is the revenue associated with each, with each of those equities on this day. So this is a start. But it's a super naive universe, right? 
high revenue is a good thing, but it might not necessarily be the only thing that we want to consider when we're building a universe. If we have a signal that's built purely on high revenue stocks, then yes, this is the correct universe. But there are many more nuances in constructing a universe. So let's try breaking down what we've just constructed, this top 500 by revenue, and see if we can look at a little bit of some of the concerns that I detailed before, right? So let's look at the breakdown of the sector. Let's look at some turnover. Let's look at some other considerations and see uh, what we come up with. So first, let's consider the sector exposure of our current version of the Lectures 500. We'll pull just the universe that we defined above. We'll pop it into the Lectures 500. We'll define these sector codes here so that we know what sector each equity is a part of. We're going to get the sector codes for each equity, and that'll just give us a pipeline, and we'll return the pipeline for our chosen day. We'll calculate the number of equities in each sector, and we'll just pull this stuff out here. And let's define some functions just to plot what's in each sector, just as a bar chart and as a pie chart. So we see that with this 500 securities with the highest revenue, we get this skew for with the financial services sector. Like it seems like everything else is relatively balanced. We've got some stuff that's very underrepresented as far as revenue is concerned. And we have financial services, which seems to be fairly overrepresented. If we then plot this down as a bar chart, we see, again, financial services is making up a big chunk of this universe. And that makes sense, because these companies have a lot of revenue, right? But this may not necessarily be how we want our universe to be constructed. If we want to reduce our sector exposure, what we could do is we could try equal weighting between sectors and enforce that as a restriction on our universe definition. But then we would end up sacrificing some of these higher revenue stocks in favor of like, whatever is classified as these miscellaneous or real estate stocks that have a lower revenue. It's also important to consider the turnover of our universe. If stocks are moving in and out of our universe and we're closing and and opening up new positions all the time based on our universe, then we're going to incur a very large amount of commissions, a lot of transaction costs associated with that. The more that stuff moves, the more that we have to pay in order to move in accordance with it. So we definitely want to look at the turnover of our universe just to make sure whether we have something consistent over time or not. If our criteria describe something unique and interesting about our universe, then ideally, our universe should stay pretty constant across time. Of course, this isn't always necessarily so, but it's something worth looking at just to make sure to, to see whether it's within the boundaries of what's acceptable for us. So if we had a turnover of zero, that would mean that our universe is entirely unchanged by any sort of market movement. Stuff that's inappropriate for our algorithm, for our universe, would never be removed, and stuff that's newly appropriate would never move in. But if stuff changes over every single day, we're going to incur a lot of costs, as I said before. What we want to do is we want to have a dynamic universe that doesn't stagnate, but isn't too excitable due to any market changes or isn't too sensitive to changes in the market. So let's get our lectures 500 data again, but for 2015 to 2016. We'll make a function for calculating the daily turnover and for plotting the daily turn turnover, as well as get some statistics on the daily turnover. So if we throw all that stuff together here, we see that the mean turnover is about 1.32, standard deviation is about 2.74, and then we have the quantiles for our turnover here. And it looks like we have a decent amount of turnover. We've got an average of about 1.3 securities being added in or removed every single day. So that's, that's fairly low. But it looks like on this actual graph, we've got a few days which are kind of spiky. So what we may be concerned about here is whether our universe is flexible enough, whether our universe is being fair on the boundaries. Likely, there's going to be a lot of stuff flitting back and forth over the boundaries. Securities that are just barely appropriate or just barely inappropriate. So sometimes what we want to do is smooth these boundaries, smooth how our universe interprets things. What we do when we smooth data is we take this noisy data and we aggregate it to analyze underlying trends. 
when we handle universe selection, what we're going to do is we're going to prevent things from bouncing in and out super frequently, preventing a lot of extra turnover. So first, what we're going to do for this smoothing is we're just going to implement a filter so that as long as an equity has passed the Lectures 500 criteria for 16 or more days out of the last 21, we'll keep it in the Lectures 500. That'll be fine. We'll call this filter at least 16. And we're going to do this using the at least n filter from Pipeline. But by applying this filter, ideally, we should be reducing the amount of noise that's happening at the border of our universe. And this should, in turn, reduce turnover. So let's check to see if that actually follows. We'll run the same functions from up above. We'll get data across the same time period, just with the addition of this at least n filter attached to it. And we see here that the mean number of securities has dropped to about 0.85 from one point whatever was up above. Our standard deviation is now about 1.4. And our spikes, our, our jumps are a little bit more consistent. Everything's overall lower than we had before. I, I think the, the highest that we had here was in the 20s. And here, the highest that we have is around 8 on a given day. So we like that this is smoother at the boundaries. We like that we have less turnover. So we're going to keep this characteristic as part of the universe moving forward. Another thing that we want to look at is whether we can actually trade an asset or not. So what we're going to do is we're just going to import this default US equity universe mask and combine it together with Electris 500 as already defined. And this is a list of some of the considerations that this default US equity universe mask takes into account. Well, we need to make sure that it actually traded yesterday, so that's a liquidity concern. We, it has to have a previous day close price, again, a liquidity concern. We don't want anything that would make it more difficult to acquire or sell the stock, anything that doesn't have a lot of movement around it. But yeah, th these are all things that we would want just a very base baseline of what's going to make something tradable or not. And we've incorporated all of this stuff together in something called the Quanto 500 and the Quanto 1500. So these are a set of dynamic pipeline filters that incorporate all of these concerns as well as some others. There's actually a post on the forums that details more clearly the aspects of the different Quanto universes. And I highly recommend checking those out just to see how we like to filter things down. These are super solid universes to start developing your algorithm. I, I know that I personally use them for all of my examples. They, they just provide an approximation of the S&P 500 and, and then extend that towards the 15, towards 1,500 securities instead. And the good part about these universes is that while well, you only need one line of code in order to actually import them. If you want to look at anything else about universes, I highly recommend reading more about the Q500 and the Q1500 at this forum post about the Q500 and the Q1500. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching the Quantopian lecture series. If you have a desire to see any more of our content, it is all available at www.quantopian.com lectures. If you're already on the Quantopian site, you can also get to this page by going over to Learn and Support, clicking on Learn, and then this lectures link will bring you right back here. All of these lectures have a notebook associated with them, which contains the theory and applications for the lecture. It's the real meat. Many of these lectures will also have a video associated with them that you can watch, just like the one that you just watched. And then some of these lectures are going to have algorithms that you can clone and iterate on just to give you a basis to start with your own algorithmic trading ideas. We also have a GitHub, which is at github.com slash quantopian slash research underscore public. All the stuff that's on our lectures page is also here if you dig around. You can also follow me on Twitter at clean underscore utensils. And we also have, last but not least, uh, some resources available for any sort of academics who want to incorporate the lecture series into their classes. All of this stuff is free. We just like to provide a little bit more guidance for professors who want to get Quantopian involved with how they teach. Lastly, you can email me at max at quantopian.com, and that's just M-A-X at quantopian.com. Feel free to send me any sort of feedback, any sort of questions you have about the lecture series. We're always looking to improve things, so we always want to hear comments about how we can make it better. Thank you so much.